Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, especially if you've seen our program before, we are doing a series on the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the last three months of 2013. And this particular lesson is lesson number 10 in that series for December 7 of 2013, and it has a long, sort of complicated title, The Eschatological Day of Atonement. Maybe we should say a word or two about that. Eschatological means something that happens at the end of this Earth's history. So that's what eschatological means. It's the lesson, as we mentioned, for December 7 of 2013. And if you're interested in getting the materials that we look at is for our discussion, they're available on the website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you will see that on your screen as well. Before we begin, because this is a little bit complicated and it's also basic Seventh-day Adventism, I would like to pray. Let's have a prayer together uh, about the discussion that's going to ensue. Our kind and loving Father, we are so thankful that you've given us the Holy Spirit to guide us through some of these passages that may be a little bit difficult. Let us see if we can understand them and come up with the message that you want us to get is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think I need to tell any of you around this table that the Adventist Church got it started, got its start out of the Advent movement of the 1830s and 40s. That in turn, that movement in turn, uh, rose out of the great religious uh, movement of that was sweeping around the world back in those days, uh, and I, we don't have time to talk about how that happened. But there was a lot of people, and if you look at the history, there were a number of other religious movements, including the one of evolution, that got it started almost exactly at the same time. Uh, during that time, was that called the Great Awakening? The Great Religious Awakening. Because when I was a kid in school, I remember it was in the history books, the Great mm -hmm. Awakening. And the teachers didn't explain it. I had no idea what the Great Awakening was. Well. But I'm not so sure that it's studied anymore no. as a part of history. Probably not. What happened, if you, if you know, want us to say it just briefly, there was the Great Earth, Lisbon Earthquake, 1755. There was the Dark Day and the Moon Turned to Blood, 1780. There was the, the United States, of course, was founded on this new idea of separation of church and state in 1776. There was the French Revolution in 1789, and then the Pope was taken captive in 1798, and people, are, and then in 1833 was the falling of the stars, and people are starting to say, hey, those things are predicted in the Bible. We better get out our Bible and start studying, and people did, and this was the conclusion. Well, I had a friend who read The Great Controversy, and he read about the stars falling in the dark day, and he didn't believe it, and he went into the archives Mm -hmm. of the newspapers and he came back and said wow there was yes. a dark day and there was uh, stars falling that was quite an event and wasn't it over eastern america yes the dark day mm -hmm. the falling stars was all over the world all over the world yes. my, that's my understanding yes mm -hmm. yeah well in daniel 7 as you probably know it talks about a lion a bear a leopard and a fourth nondescript beast and three of the horns of the nondescript beast are uprooted by a single small horn that makes claims and blasphemous boasts against God. We covered those stories in some detail in our last lesson. In Daniel 8, he talks about a ram, a he-goat, a little horn again, and then moves on to talk about a prophecy of 2,300 days or years. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Why do you say he-goat? Is there a she-goat? Is there another word for yeah. he goat? Is it called a ram or billy goat? A billy goat sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but he, it could be a ram also. He, he goat is an actual word then. And I'm not uh, yes, and I'm not sure why they separate rams from he goats. Uh, but it's interesting to notice this point, whereas the animals in Daniel seven are wild animals, lions and bears and leopards and a nondescript beast. It's interesting that here in Daniel 8, what kind of animals are these? Domesticated. These are animals that were used in the sanctuary services. 
that were, that were actually killed as, as sacrifices. That's an interesting point, isn't it? I wonder if that's, that, that teaches us something. Well, at the end of that 2300 days and years, we have suggested that the pre-advent judgment begins and we enter the time of the end. The historical context suggests that this little horn represents Papal Rome. And what does Papal Rome attack? Well, if, we're gonna, if we want to pull in Revelation 12 and 13, it was a religious war against the divine heavenly prince, his sanctuary, and his people. Whoops. If we remember Revelation 12 and 13, we'll recognize that this, behind this power lies the devil himself. And what does the little horn do? It replaces the daily sacrifices, the daily things went on the sanctuary, or tamid, priestly med mediation in the heavenly sanctuary with an earthly priesthood consisting of mediating priesthood, the sacrifice of the mass, the confessional, and the worship of Mary. So these are the things that this little horn wants to put in place of what the Bible talks about, the heavenly, heavenly priestly ministry that was going on up there. What do you mean by the sacrifice of the mass? Is that the well, wine and, and bread? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. I had a, a lady, and she was a Catholic, and she says, something is special about our, um, is it called Eucharist? Yeah. Or our, mm -hmm. She says, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's special. <laughs> okay. So. Well, remember, when we talk about sacrifices um, to a Catholic, they believe in what is called transubstantiation. That's another long word. But they believe that that wine and that little wafer that they eat are literally the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Literally. The priest, priest kind of becomes a creator at that yes. time. Yeah, and he creates God. Yeah. So the question that arises, how long can this trampling of the temple, this replacement of the daily priesthood of God continue? And that's the question in those famous verses, Daniel 8, 9 to 13. Just look at those for a moment. Out of one of these four horns grew a little horn whose power extended towards the south and the east and towards the promised land. Now that's an important thing for us to notice. It grew strong enough to attack the army of heaven. So it's pretty clear that this little horn is not just conquering things here on this earth. The stars themselves, and who do stars represent in the heavenly, in, in the biblical picture? Angels. Angels. And it threw some of them to the ground and trampled on them. Do we have any other, any, any place else in the Bible that talks about somebody throwing angels down to the ground? Revelation 12. Revelation 12. And who is it that does it? God throws them down. The dragon, no. the tail. The of dragon. Them. He with his tra down. with his tail, he sweeps and who is the dragon later in so Revelation twelve? The devil himself. The devil himself. Exactly with what we his deceptions he gathers followers yep. in the angels. It even defied the prince of the heavenly army, stopped the daily sacrifices offered to him, and desecrated the temple. This is right out of the, the books of Daniel Revelation here. People sinned there, be, instead of offering the proper daily sacrifices and true religion was thrown to the ground. The horn was successful in everything it did. It did. Then he heard another, then he heard one angel ask another, how long will these things that were seen in, this, in the vision continue? How long will, be, will an awful sin replace the daily sacrifices? How long will the army of heaven and the temple be trampled on? And that's the question that we're trying to struggle with today. That what is the scope of that. Are we talking about heaven, earth, yeah. or are we talking about both? We're talking principally, well, what we're really talking is about is something here on this earth that's trying to attack something that's going on in heaven. It's a religious war. But it, it talked about heaven. Uh, the prince was actually attacked. Yeah. You know, these horns grow up and point towards heaven, so it's like it's um, describing th something that's happening, happening in heaven, mm -hmm. or happened in heaven, and it may have been a continuation even to the point well, here, here's where... Here's this little, being, little horn, and, he, and he's saying blasphemous things against God. He's uprooting other horns. He's saying boastful things, and now he's... if The, the parallel is from 
Revelation 12, we have the devil, and it says he sweeps it down, he, he pulls down the stars. Revelation 12 says that the dragon pulls down the stars. You know, the devil deceived the angels, and so he pulled down the ones that followed him. Now, are you saying that the devil is deceiving the people on the earth so they don't see what's going on in heaven? They see his, his uh, methods of doing things, imitations, and he's keeping the people from viewing heaven. So now he's trying to sweep in humans like he swept, swept uh, angels. Yeah. Well, notice very carefully something that we might jump over if we're, if we're not careful. Daniel, what was Daniel praying for in Daniel 9? The end of the 70 years. He read in Jeremiah a couple of places God's promise that the occupation and the exile was going to end in 70 years. So he says, you know, we have made a terrible mess of things. But God, you promise, please allow us to go back to Jerusalem and to Judah. And that's what he's praying for. And what kind of response does he get? 2,300 evenings and mornings. More than he bargained for. More than he bargained for. So read that. He, he not only got, was, he got the answer of how God is going to end the exile for the whole world, the whole great mm -hmm. controversy. So God more than answered his prayer yeah. with something else. Yeah. So he says, I heard the other angel answer. It will continue for 2,300 years evenings and mornings, during which sacrifices will not be offered, then the temple will be destroyed. And so, of restored, course... Restored. Restored, I'm sorry. Restored. Um, then, of course, Daniel's response is, well, what does that have to do with the answering to my question? Are you saying, God, that the temple in Jerusalem is not going to be restored until many, many, many years from now? Well, Daniel's response, I was trying to understand what the vision meant when suddenly someone was standing in front of me. I heard a, sm a voice call out over the river Ulai. Gabriel explained to him the meaning of what he saw. Gabriel came and stood beside me, and I was so terrified that I fell to the ground. He said to me, mortal man, understand the meaning. The vision has to do with the end of the world. So now, is this talking about something that's going to happen just in a few days after, in, in Daniel's day? I was just talking about something far in the future. Far in the future. Yes, exactly. So no here. wonder Daniel got sick and, and... Yeah, exactly. He got sick for days, didn't he? When, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, Daniel eight fourteen. What does it mean to suggest that the sanctuary will be restored or cleansed? The Hebrew word is ZDG. Uh, and there's different ways to pronounce it. It has three meanings. A restoration, as in Isaiah 10, 22. A cleansing or purif a purification, Job 4, 17 and 25, 4. And a legal vindication, if you're talking a legal setting, in Job 34, verse 5. Since the temple on this earth no longer existed, during the prophetic time period that we are talking about, he must have been referring to the heavenly sanctuary. I mean... You're talking about a time period, and you say the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. The temple in Jerusalem has already been completely destroyed and gone. What sanctuary is going to be cleansed? Or restored to its or restored. Rightful, rightful state. Yeah. It was said, who said, your ways are in the sanctuary, O God? David said that in Psalms. And so the ways of God's sanctuary are going to be restored again. Yeah. This little horn isn't going to be able to deceive people yep. any longer. We're going to be able to see God's way in the sanctuary. Was there a cleansing in the ancient sanctuary out in the desert there? You mean well, the once a year cleansing? What do we call that? An atonement or atonement. The day of atonement. Yeah, Leviticus 16, right? Mm. Thus the divine judgment described in Daniel 7 must be equal to the day of restoration in Daniel 8. Could this also parallel the time of God's judgment in Revelation 14, 6, and 7? There's a possibility. Because there in, in Revelation 12, 13, and 14, we have the devil sweeping things down out of heaven. 
We have that happening here in Daniel 8. And then finally, we get over to Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We have the judgment coming up. And here in Daniel, we have a judgment. We had Daniel 7, we had a judgment seat. Do we have a judgment seat in Daniel 8? Well, we're talking about a day of atonement. Isn't that a, a type of judgment? Are well, you saying all these are, are speaking of the same judgment? I'm asking the question. Now let's see if we can find out. Okay. Through a careful study of the original languages and the imagery, we discover that Daniel 8 has many parallels with the Day of Atonement. There's sanctuary imagery. Remember we mentioned already that the two animals that are in Daniel 8 were sacrificial animals in the ancient sanctuary. There's purification of the sanctuary and the people. That's happening here in Daniel 8. Uh, there's judgment and there's creation. But when the conflict is all over, God himself and his people will be vindicated. He has not forgotten his promise. He can predict the future far in advance. Nothing is out of his control. But now let's, let's be honest. Does it really seem possible that a prophecy given to a Jewish exile more than 500 years before Christ could actually accurately predict events down all the way down to the year 1844, just 150 years ago? Does that seem possible? Well, look, uh, Cyrus was named many years before he was even born. He A couple hundred named, years anyway, yeah. Uh, he was named and said what he was going to do. So why is it such a stretch that... Um, it was a Messiah. Yeah. It, yeah. Was a, it was a Messiah. Yeah. And some say that the Messiah is not even mentioned in the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, it, Jewish and he people. is. He's not in the Torah. Yeah. Well, in answer to the question, time has proven it correct. If you look mm -hmm. at the, the fall of all these kingdoms and the world as we have it today. We're very, very lucky in that we can look back and see how the Bible has come true. Can you imagine living way back mm -hmm. and they still had faith and trusted God like the wise men followed the star mm -hmm. um, because they knew it was going to uh, lead them to the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're very lucky in that we can look back and still we have doubts. I mean, yeah. shame well, on us. Well, let's think about this. There's a prophecy of the, 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 the ram and the eagle. What do they represent? We don't have time to go into all the stuff now, but clearly it's, it says just in so many words, what, do they re what countries do they represent? The ram was a symbol of media Persia, and the eagle was a symbol of Greece. And it says that right there. Angel Gabriel explains it. So certainly we can't, we can't argue with that. And then the events that happen after that must go on further into the future, right? So this is way after Daniel's time. It can't be something way back then. Go, back, go down to verses 17 and 19. What are they talking about? Gabriel came and stood beside me, and I was so terrified that I fell to the ground. We lived, read this a moment ago. He said to me, mortal man, I understand the meaning. The vision has to do with the end of the world. While he was talking, I fell to the ground unconscious, but he took hold of me, raising me to my feet, and, I, and said, I am showing you what the result of God's anger will be. The vision refers to the time of the end. So, if we're going to believe the Bible, this refers to... this. These verses refer to what time period? The time of the end. The end of this world's history. So if, if Daniel 8 is able to predict that far in advance, how does that fit with Daniel 9? Well, several years went by. And, and yeah, I mean, I, we don't have time to go back and look at all this, but if you compare Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, you find out that several years went by and no, Daniel did not receive any explanation. And he, finally in Daniel 9, he prays and he said, God, we have sinned, we don't deserve your things, but for your namesake, you need to do something. You need to restore Jerusalem because you said you would. Otherwise, who's going to ever believe you in the future? So, wasn't there another person that said, God, for your namesake? Wasn't that Moses? So Moses said that. There's a number of people. Ezekiel says it. They were all worried about God for your namesake. Mm -hmm. So we go down here, and what do we, what do we come to? Well, we come to Daniel 9, 24. Seven, well, let me just back up a little bit. Look at um, 
Verse, let's start with verse 20. Daniel 9 now, verse 20. Daniel's praying, he's looking, he, he's still troubled by that vision. And all of a sudden, there's no new vision here. He's not given a new vision. He's given an explanation of something. I went on praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and pleading with the Lord my God to restore his holy temple. So what's Daniel still praying for? He wants his people released. The end of the seven-year prophecy. He's still saying, God, please, 70 years you promised. It's almost, the time has almost come, right? So if he hadn't have prayed, do you think the He might not have been given a an explanation? An explanation, or do you think the uh, temple would have still been restored? Of course, that's kind of a dumb question, because yeah. that would, yeah. 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 Well, look at verse 21 going on. While I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came flying down to, whom I, to where I was. It was a time for the evening sacrifice to be offered. He explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. Well, understand which prophecy? Is there a prophecy earlier in Daniel 9 that he's going to explain? No, it's just Daniel's prayer and his pleading. So it has to go back. Remember, there were no chapter and verse divisions in the original. So the prophecy that's right up above there is, Dan is a prophecy in Daniel 8, isn't it? You said that he came down in the time of the um, evening sacrifice. Yeah. Were they doing sacrifices then? It doesn't say they were doing sacrifices. It just but said it was th the time this was the time for it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Are the chapters in, in uh, Daniel's chapters in chronological order? No, they aren't. Well, these two are because it specifically says yeah, so, right. but okay. there's others that aren't. Okay. So, um, Dan he explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. It has to be the prophecy from Daniel 8. When you began to plead with God, he answered you. He loves you, and so I have come to tell you the answer. Now pay attention while I explain the vision. Now, some people have taken very interesting liberties with that verse and saying, well, how long does it take you to, to read the prayer of Daniel? Maybe he was praying slowly, but no more than a few minutes. Did Gabriel come all the way from heaven down to this earth in those few minutes? It's a little faster than the speed of light, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, what does he say now? He doesn't explain the 70 years that Daniel was praying for. He doesn't explain the 2300 years that he had mentioned in Daniel 8. What does he say? Seven times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from sin and evil. Seven times 70, or 70 times seven, how many is that? 490. 490 years. And this word has set for freeing your people, the, the word, the primitive version of that just means cut off for your people. So that the vision, sin will be forgiven, internal justice established, so that the vision and the prophecy will come true. And I'm going to take us to a, a different handout here, very quickly. And we're going to look at that issue here. You know, that's like when Jesus was talking to his disciples. They asked him about the immediate, and he started giving them information about the end of the world. Yep. Exactly. Okay. What handout are we going to? We're going to go to a handout here discussing Daniel 9, 24 to 7 specifically. Okay. And these handouts will be available on theox.org. And they will be available. Under Sabbath School. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. During the first year of the reign of Darius, the Mede, Daniel prayed for his people and to find out how and when the prophecy of 70 years recorded in Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, and 29, 10 would be fulfilled. We've mentioned that already. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Daniel, he, he was there at the beginning of the 70 years because mm -hmm. he was captive. Yes. So now he is 70 years old. Like when he came, he was maybe 15. So now he's, what, about 85? At least. At least. Daniel recognized that the Jews had sinned and misrepresented God down through the years, but he pleaded with Yahweh God to do something to preserve God's own reputation. Look at these words. I'm just going to read the highlighted part. O Lord our God, you showed your power by bringing your people out of Egypt 
and your power is still remembered. And then dropping down Jerusalem, it is your city, your sacred hill. And dropping down again, verse 17. O oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. And then in verse 18, listen to us, O oh God, look at us and see the trouble we are in in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. When he says restore your temple, your ways are in the temple, so he means restore your ways. Yeah. And verse 19, Lord hear us, Lord forgive us, Lord listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. So what's Daniel saying? He's saying in our world, in his day, Gods were judged by the the fate of their peoples, and and God and Daniel is saying, "Look at your people, God. I know they've been awful sinful, but they're scattered around the world. They're a bunch of slaves. Who's going to believe in you when your people are like this?" So God heard Daniel's prayer. We noticed that God really loved Daniel. He cared enough about Daniel that he want, went to the effort of explaining things to him, and that's what we just read. Daniel has has been praying for an immediate restoration of Jerusalem and the Jews in Palestine, but what God told him was it would take 490 more years before the holy city would be freed from sin and evil. All commentators agree that the 70 weeks mentioned in these verses refer to 490 years. There's no way that it can be 70 literal weeks. So everybody says, no, it has to be. No question about it. This requires the app. I mean, even if you try, to, if you try to say that Daniel was written way later in the days of the Maccabees, there's no way you can make seventy weeks fit there. So they're just they're just stuck. You have is, to say. Is this the day for a year? Yes. Application. Okay. So we're now four hundred ninety years, and the only prophecy and time period of sufficient length for which it could be cut off is the twenty three hundred evenings and mornings described in Daniel eight fourteen. So, six so apparently, that would suggest that these two prophecies must begin. See, if you cut something off, here you have a big piece of something. If you cut something off, you have to either have to cut it off the beginning, or you have to cut it off the end, right? So, clearly, it was starting there in Daniel's day, so it's actually, this 490 years has to be cut off from the beginning. Okay? So, six different things were supposed to happen during those 490 years. Two were the responsibility of the Jewish people themselves. Two were God's responsibility. And the final two would be the result of the first four. Okay? And that's specifically, we started to read that, Daniel 9, 24. Um, Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established so that the vision of the prophecy will come true and the holy temple will be rededicated. Okay? So that's and restored. So those are the things. God's people too. Now we're going to go back to the literal. We're going to actually work with the Young's literal translation. So we're going to make it as close to the original languages as we can. So hopefully we'll all be together here. God's people were to shut up the transgression and to seal up sins. What do you suppose that means? Mm -hmm. Shut up the devil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what else? Seal up sins. The idea is God says, I'm going to give you 490 years, and I know that you haven't been doing very well so far, but I'm going to give you another 490 years. This is the time you have to get over this sinful experience. To get it right. To get it right. To stop your rebellion. Yeah. And cleanse the nation of the sins that have plagued them for so long, making way for the development of a truly righteous society. Did they do that? Nope. Nope. And what was God going to do in response? Cover iniquity. Cover iniquity and to bring in righteous age during. Now that's Young's literal way of saying forever. So God was, the, the sins that were left, that weren't cleaned up, God was going to cover with his righteousness yeah. and bring in uh, sinless. Well, what did God do? God would send the Messiah to provide the complete and final atonement for sin and establish an everlasting righteousness. So as a result of the, that combination of things, what they were supposed to do but actually didn't do, and what God was going to do, two more things would happen, to seal up vision and prophet and to anoint the Holy of Holies. No further prophecy would come to the Jewish people. This was the last one for them. 
Stephen the deacon preacher prophet gave the final warning to the Sanhedrin in his speech to them as recorded in Acts 7. You remember that magnificent, in fact that's the best sermon probably in the whole Bible. A magnificent sermon. And what was the result? They rejected him, they stoned him, and they began an intense persecution of the early Christian church that resulted in the scattering of missionaries, apostles and others, who took the gospel to the Gentiles. So what was the result of that final event there, that seminal event? The function of the temple as it was was finished. Okay, but that actually happened a little bit earlier when the temple, when the, when the curtain was torn from top to bottom. But what's happening here? What did we say just happened? The Christian church began to suffer terrible persecution in Jerusalem and the territory around. So what did the Christians do? Scattered. Scattered. And they began preaching the gospel to whom? The Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Good. That's what happened. In other words, God's chosen people now are not just a select hereditary group of Jews, but now God is saying everybody has an equal access to the plan of salvation. It's going to Gentiles as well as Jews. Well, if God hadn't have done that, his gospel wouldn't have gotten yeah. very far because the Jews didn't want to transport it on. Yeah. Do we know when, Corne when Peter and Cornelius had their experience? We don't have a date for that, no. We know it came between certain events and certain other events. Was it before this, A.D. 34, uh, or after? After, because Peter was still in Jerusalem at this point in time when that happened. Yeah, so this was after, it came afterwards. So the focus of God's work would no longer be the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple in heaven. And God's message would be spread to every possible person in our world. So, Daniel's, I mean, this is great stuff, huh? Next, God gave Daniel the keys to determine when things would take, these things would take place. He said, and I quote, From the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem, to Messiah the leader, leader is seven weeks and sixty and two weeks. So seven plus sixty-two, how long is that? 69 together, right? Four decrees have been identified as relating to the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They are all found in the book of Ezra. So let's look at those. The first decree happened in the year 538 BC. It was the decree of Cyrus allowing Zerubbabel and Joshua to lead nearly 50,000 Jews back home. That actually should be 535. There's a typographical error there. And, uh, and we read about it. Let me just read Ezra 6, verses 3 to 5. In the first year of his reign, Cyrus the emperor commanded that the temple in Jerusalem be rebuilt as a place where sacrifices are made and offerings are built, are burnt. The temple is to be 27 meters high and 27 meters wide. And so, well, I'll go ahead. The walls are to be built with one layer of wood on top of every three layers of stone. All expenses are to be paid by the royal treasury. Also, the gold and silver utensils which King Nebuchadnezzar brought to Babylon from the temple in Jerusalem are to be returned to their proper place in the Jerusalem temple. Now, make sure it's very important for us to notice this was a command to rebuild what? Temple. The temple. Okay? And the prophecy in Daniel 8 is talking about a temple? Or what? It's the rebuilding of Jerusalem, isn't it? Okay, So the second decree, which happened in 520 B.C., was given to Darius one, given by Darius one, in Ezra 6, 6 to 12. Let's look at that. Then Darius sent the following reply to Tatnai, governor of West Jephaz, da 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 da, and others, Step away, uh, stay away from the temple and do not interfere with its construction. Let the governor of Judah and the Jewish leaders rebuild the temple of God where it stood before, and he goes on to give the details. So, and who were the prophets involved in that? Restore, restoration of the temple, rebuilding of the temple? Haggai and Zechariah. Haggai and Zechariah, and you can read about what they did in, in those two books. So that was the second decree. Have we rebuilt Jerusalem yet? No. The third decree came many years later in 457 BC. We'll talk about that date a little bit later. Yes? Actually, 
a number of people had built houses, and that was yeah. one of Haggai and Zechariah's complaints, right. is you've built your houses and you haven't built a temple. Right. But they didn't have a secure city. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and we're going to yeah, come to that point in a moment. So this third degree came many years later, 457 BC, when Ezra asked King Artaxerxes to give permission and funding for Ezra to return to Jerusalem with a group of a few thousand people. And the key verse in that explanation, it's Ezra 7, 11 to 26, but the key verse is verse 18. And that which, and I'm still reading from Young's literal translation so we can get as close to the original language as possible. And that which, and it talks about, you know, going back and offering a sacrifice for me in the temple in Jerusalem, etc. And that which to thee and to thy brethren is good to do with the rest of the silver and gold, according to the will of your God, ye do. So, what was Ezra, what had Ezra been praying for? What was he praying about? Do you remember? The rebuilding of the temple. No, the temple had been rebuilt already. It was already rebuilt. This is 60 years later. He has received news that there's a problem in Jerusalem. The people are being attacked by all the people around them. They can't build it. You know, there's all, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah, he said. So what does he pray for? Ezra 9, verse 9 to give us a quickening to lift up the house of our God and to cause its waste to cease and to give to us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem, Ezra 9.9. 9. So that's what Ezra was praying for. Okay? Yeah. So when the king says, here's a bunch of money, go and, and you can use some of it in the temple and sacrifices, etc. But you can use the rest for what you want to use it for. And what did they want to use it for? To build the wall. To rebuild the wall. Now, who was opposing them? All the local people. All, all the, the local Samaritans, enemies, the uh, Samaritans and others there. So, but the Western governors, as they're called, who ruled the surrounding areas, wrote a letter to Artaxerxes spelling out how much trouble the Jews in this, their city of Jerusalem had been in the past. And that's in Ezra 4, 7 to 16. Those governors received permission from Artaxerxes to stop the building at Jerusalem. So even though he was given permission and they started, they were stopped. I listened to a sermon and it, it compared the four functions of the four decrees with the three angels and then the one that came and lightened the whole world. Mm -hmm. And the third decree is to build the wall, the breach mm -hmm. in the wall, whereas the third angel's message is to build up God's law, the fourth commandment that has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting. An interesting and, and parallel. I don't know if it's, it's stretching it, but it was an interesting parallel. Okay, so the fourth decree came 13 years later in 444 BC when Nehemiah the king's cupbearer received, received permission to go to Jerusalem. And what did Nehemiah do, do you remember? He arrived, he didn't make any announcement. He waited there for about three or four days. He said, okay, now we're gonna go out at night so nobody will see us, and we're gonna survey this wall. And after he'd surveyed the wall, he went inside and quietly made arrangements. He says, okay, all of you are gonna help me. This is what we're gonna do. We are gonna rebuild this wall and the gates and we're gonna finish this job, okay? And they did, and it, 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 if you read the story there, it took them 52 days, and they were so opposed that they would have to stand with a sword. The, the book says stand with the sword in one hand and building wall with the other hand. But they did it, 52 and, days. And Nehemiah was a layperson, right? He wasn't yes. a, he wasn't No, a, he was not a priest like yeah. Ezra. And so for the fourth angel that lights the world, um, God needs a bunch of Nehemiah's lay people to work together, finish the work quickly, like the yep. wall. Okay, so now... The question for Adventists, the question that William Miller worked on, was how do we date this, these decrees? Now, we've say, suggested it was in 457 B.C. How do we know that? Archaeology. Archaeology. tablets, all that stuff. Okay. Well, let's look at this. Two more questions remain about this decree. When was it given, and, and according to which calendar should it be figured? 
Because the 70 week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27 begins with the issuing of Artaxerxes' decree, as recorded in Ezra 7, the date of that decree becomes important. The key to the date of the decree is tied to Artaxerxes' seventh year. It says right there. In fact, we can read that, Ezra 7, 8. They left Babylonia on the first day of the first month, and with God's help, they arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And if you go back, it's, it's you know, seventh degree of, of um, his, his uh, reign. So, um, and we got his reign as far as when it started? Well, that's what we're going to look, look at now. Uh, under, condition, under conditions of a forced march, the Babylonian army could cover the 400 miles from Babylon to Jerusalem in one month. That's a young, vigorous male army making as fast pace as they can, some of them riding on horses even. Ezra had a large body of slow-moving people with him, and it took them five months to cover the same distance about uh, 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 less than 100 miles per month. Three miles a day. Yeah. Fortunately, the dates for Artaxerxes' reign are well known and historically secure. They are based on several sources. First, the Greek historians such as Herodotus preserve some of these dates in terms of their own dating system of Olympiads. Now you remember, the Greeks had it all spelled out for hundreds of years, and every four years they had an Olympiad, and they were named, etc. So you can go back, and you can actually date some of the events of Artaxerxes' reign based on the Greek calendar. And we today have Olympics every four years. That's right, based on that ancient Greek calendar. Wow. Second, the astronomer Ptolemy, who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, in the second century AD, that's quite a while later, provided a tablet of correlating the regnal years, the years that they, were, they reigned, of certain rulers of the ancient <coughs> world with astronomical eclipses. So how is he tying these dates? He's basing them on eclipses of the moon and eclipses of the sun. And he says, okay, this such a thing happened during this certain king's reign, etc., etc. So astronomers can go back and calculate when those things happened and nail it down. <coughs> this list is, is officially known as Ptolemy's Canon, and it goes all the way back to the 8th century BC. So now there's a second way of, of trying to identify these things, or date them. Some of these eclipse, those eclipses occurred during the reign of Artaxerxes, and helped to fix his dates precisely. So they, we can date those, some of those dates down to the very day. Our solar system is that reliable and yes. accurate that they can go back. <coughs> More recent archaeological discoveries have helped to refine the system provided by the Greek historians and the astron astronomer Ptolemy. And then third, yeah, we've got two systems now so far. <coughs> third, the highest <coughs> regnal dates on business tablets from Babylonia have been compiled from cuneiform tablets. These extend from the 7th century BC to the 1st century AD. So uh, let's, let's talk about how that happens. There are literally thousands and thousands of business tablets uh, in, that have been dug up. Little clay tablets that says such and such an event happened in such and such a year, such and such a month, of such and such a king. So if you line these all up, we can say, okay, this king reigned for this many of years, this king reigned for this many years, and here are these tablets, and you can actually reconstruct a calendar from all those, putting all those little tablets in order. Is that what the archaeological digs have come that's up with? What he's, yeah. That's what Kerry was talking to us about, archaeology. Thousands of these things. And they can date the reign of Artaxerxes from using those tablets. And finally, a series of papyri have been found in Egypt. Now we've gone from the clay tablets from Mesopotamia down to the, the, the paper uh, things from Egypt. These papyri are letters and business documents written in Aramaic by Jews serving in the Persian army on the island of Elephantine in the Nile where they manned a Persian fort on Egypt's southern border. So here are some Jews working for the Persian government, the, what would be the Iranian government now, but they're down manning this fort in southern Egypt. Okay? So what do they do? They double date these documents giving the Egyptian dating and giving the Mesopotamian dating. 
So some of these documents come from the time of Artaxerxes and reign and are an aid to con confirming his regnal dates. Thus, there are four main lines of evidence which guide us in establishing the dates for Artaxerxes' reign. The Greek historians, the Ptolemy's canon, the Babylonian business tablets, and the Elephantine papyri from Egypt. All four lines of evidence point to the same chronological conclusion. Xerxes, the, the, the king, the father of Artaxerxes, died in 465 BC, and Artaxerxes came to the throne in the latter part of that year. Under the Persian and Babylonian system of counting regnal years, or reigning years, the remaining remainder of that year, the, the remainder of the year of, in which a king died was considered to be year zero of the new king who succeeded him. It was called the accession year. In other words, the years that a given king reigned were dated on the basis of the fact that he marched at the head of the New Year's Day parade, so now that's his year. So. The year, if, if, the, if the, the old king dies on January 2, it's still, he marched in the parade, and so that was his year. So the next year, when the next king reign, uh, marches in the New Year's Day parade, then that's his year. That's the way the Babylonians did it. Mm -hmm. So the new king's first official year began with the next new year, which commenced in the spring. According to the, this reckoning, Artaxerxes' seventh year, began in the spring of 458 B.C. and ended in the spring of 457 B.C. Thus, by the Persian calendar, Ezra would have begun his journey from Babylon in the spring of 458 B.C. and arrived in Jerusalem in the summer of that same year. I but, sure am glad there are mathematicians in the world that like to go and isn't this, this is their something? delight to do. This is incredible. Yeah. The Jews, however, considered the new year to begin in the fall according to the civil calendar by which they kept track of the reigns of their kings and those of other nations. The Jews also used a religious calendar which began the year at a different time, much like our modern fiscal calendar, often begins in July, while the regular, year, the regular calendar year begins in January. Thus, by the Jewish civil calendar, Artaxerxes' seventh year would have begun in the fall of 458 B.C. and ended in the fall of 457 B.C., according to the Jewish calendar. By this reckoning, Ezra would have begun his journey to Jerusalem in the spring of 457 B.C., arriving there in the summer of the same year. Since Ezra used the Jewish civil calendar, not the Persian calendar, we should apply his date, the 457 B.C., as the Persians would have considered it. I mean, 458 as the Persians would have considered it. This date, 457 B.C., gives us the starting point for the prophecy of the 70 weeks given in Daniel 9.24. To recap, this is how we arrived at the starting date for Daniel's 70 weeks, which was to begin with the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, after all that, whew, where do we go from there? Well, one thing that's nice, the, the year-to-day system that the Bible has makes that a little easier because it's just counting days. Yeah. Whereas this, you have to go all over the place to to find points where they start yeah. and do shifting around. But you can just lay the day for year prophecy over the top of them and you can get the, yeah. get but the these points. other It is good to notice that all these other calendars, if you spend your time working them all out, they nail down that date and they tell us exactly. And so there it is. Kind and of a cross-reference. Yeah. yeah. And it's, the references are independent of each other and they cross. So of the four decrees mentioned in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah regarding the return of the Jews to Jerusalem, the third one, the one Artaxerxes call, gave to Ezra, is the one that fulfills most closely the specification of the prophecy in Daniel. So Ezra 7.8 ties this decree to Artaxerxes' seven, Artaxerxes seventh year. They left Babylonia on the first day of the first month, and with God's help they arrived in Jerusalem on the fifth, first day of the fifth month. and, and uh, back up here, if we go back up here to many years later, the first verse, when Arsenal was emperor of Persia, there was a man named Ezra, traced and so forth and so forth. So, mm -hmm. um, if you look down to verse 6 to 8, my Bible puts those all together. Uh, it says here, because Ezra had the blessing of the Lord his God, the emperor gave him everything he asked for. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Ezra set out from Babylonia. So there's the there's the seventh year part, okay? Now, they call it Babylonia instead of 
Well, Babylon was the capital. Babylonia was the whole territory that it ruled. Okay. And the Jews that went back to Jerusalem, how many stayed in Babylonia and how many actually went to Jerusalem to rebuild the well, we, temple and the walls? Yeah. We don't know for sure, but it was a very small percentage that actually went back to Jerusalem. Like 10, some, some, No, some people say 1 or 2 percent. Mm -hmm. Most of the Jews stayed where they were. Most of the Jews liked the comforts of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having established the beginning date of this prophecy, to what concluding date does it take us? Well, look at Daniel 9, 25. We've read this before, but let's look. Note this and understand it. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years or seven times seventy years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong, I'm sorry, seven times, yeah, that's right, seven times seven, that's the 49 defenses, and will stand for seven times 62 years, but this will be a time of troubles. So, and at the end of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. Okay? So, we, we, we've got some kind of something going on here. So, 49 years, the next for 62 years, 62 weeks of years, 434 years, making a total of 69 weeks, or 483 years. This takes us down to 27 A.D. Remember that there was no zero year between B.C. and A.D. But what is to happen at the end of this period? The prophecy takes us, tell Messiah the leader. Tell, if you read it literally, tell Messiah the leader. When, uh, what year did Jesus start his ministry? Hold on, let's, let's, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, what does it mean for the Messiah, the Anointed One, to come? Well, the logical thing would be he came and he starts his ministry, right? What event are we to look for in 1827? Messiah's birth or his death or something else? Baptism. Baptism. Well, when did Jesus of Nazareth begin the become the Messiah? Since Messiah means the Anointed One, Jesus became the Messiah, technically speaking, when he was anointed. When was this? He did not have oil poured over his head like the Old Testament kings and priests of Jerusalem, but was there a specific occasion when he was anointed and formally began his public ministry? Baptism. Yes, at his the Holy, baptism. The Holy Spirit came down on his head. The Holy Spirit came down as a dove, and not only that, what else happened? Well, look at these verses. Does this sound like an anointing? At that time, Jesus arrived from Galilee and came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to make him change his mind. I ought to be baptized by you, John said, and yet you have come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so for now, for this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. And where were you reading? Um, this is Matthew thir chapter 3, verses 13 and following. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God. That would be what? The Holy Spirit, Holy right? Spirit. Coming down like a dove and alighting on him. So Jesus is there, the Holy Spirit is there, then a voice said from heaven, so which member of the Godhead is still left up in heaven? God himself. The Father. This is my own dear Son with whom I am pleased. So all three members of the Godhead were there giving their blessing to that special occasion, and we would call that the anointing. Doesn't anointing mean just set apart? No, anointing means actually you, you put some oil or something on someone's head. Well, you, it could be a setting apart, yeah. Well, I thought maybe the, the oil was just the, the symbol of you know, it. The symbol of that. Okay. Well, Luke tells us that John the Baptist began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Augustus, Tiberius' adoptive father, died in AD 14. Adding 15 years to this date, we arrive at A.D. 29, not A.D. 27. Oh, dear. So now we're still in trouble, right? Two years off, huh? <laughs> Two years late for Daniel's prophecy. But there's a further factor here. Two years before Augustus died, the Roman Senate voted Tiberius co-ruler of the provinces with his father Augustus. Such an arrangement is called a co-regency and is similar to the situation when King David put Solomon on the throne with him before his own death in 1 Kings 1. Judea was among the provinces that came under the joint rule of Tiberius with Augustus in A.D. 12. Thus the events involving Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah, which occurred in the Roman province of Judea, came reasonably, can reasonably be dated according to this arrangement by which Tiberius began to rule with his father in A.D. 12. 
adding Luke's 15 years of Tiberius' reign to this date brings us to the year AD 27 for the Messiah's public inauguration as Daniel pro Daniel's prophecy predicted. So in AD 27, Jesus was baptized? Jesus was baptized. So and that's... Where, where did this information all come from? This came from a, a book that was written by, well, a, a series of books called The Abundant Life Bible Amplifier, the, the book on Daniel 7 through 12. It's page 67. That, now, all, that, all that math we did the last few minutes. When Jesus was baptized, how old was he? We don't know for sure. Probably about 30 or 31, something like that. Yeah. What is the date for the end of the 70 weeks? Now, we've got to the end of the 69 weeks, haven't we? Jesus has been anointed. So if the 69th week ended in 27 AD, then the 70th week, 70th week of the 70-week prophecy would end seven years later in AD 34. What happened then? Stephen. Stephen gave his speech. He was stoned and the gospel scattered to the Gentiles. And what happened in AD 31 in the middle of that week? Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified. So if the 70 weeks comes to an end in AD 34 and we, we take our 2300 year prophecy and we subtract 490, how many do we have left? You fast mathematicians? 1810. 1810 years left. If we add 1810 years to 490, I mean to 34 years, what do we come down to? 1844. And that's the end of the prophecy of the 2300 days and years and the beginning of the time of the end and the pre-advent judgment. What does all this mean? It means that God is in charge. He knew exactly what was happening in advance. He predicted the coming of his son, his baptism, the, his crucifixion, the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles, and all the way down to the time of the end, which began in the year 1844 when the final pre-advent judgment began. God listens to our prayers just as he listened to Daniel's prayer and gave this marvelous fulfillment. And of those of you who care a little bit about math and the fact that it lines up, you'll be delighted to know that God did it right. If you want to get these materials with all these numbers and everything, Remember, they're available on our website at theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And we hope you've enjoyed this time we've, we've put together and the, the information. And we will plan to see you again next week. Thanks for joining us.